Good morning. We are looking at the third church in our study of the seven churches found in the book of Revelation. Now, we are studying the book of Revelation because it is a fascinating study. It's something that is oftentimes not done nearly as much as it should, and so many people have a mistaken view of what the book of Revelation is about. And to begin with, we see that Jesus opens up with a series of visions where he basically tells John, I want these things recorded and sent to the the seven churches of Asia. These seven churches that each one has a slightly different message, but ultimately it conveys the overarching health of Christianity during this time. Now we have looked at the churches that so far have, you know, one was persecuted and and one was, you know, doing a really great job. Uh, So we've looked at a couple of churches. Now we're going to look at the church that compromised and the danger associated with that. In Revelation chapter 2, Starting in verses 12 through 17, we read of the church at Pergamos. Now, Pergamos was a city that was a religious center. In fact, as this region grew, it would become the religious center of Asia. And it had four temples to the four Roman gods, and then it had three temples to three emperors. They worshipped the emperors during this time. And one of the temples was even a temple of, you know, to the god of medicine. And and people would come from all over, and they would be like, okay, well, we need help. People with deformities, people with health issues. That This was the city, so it was full of people who were in desperate need, people who were poor, people who were struggling and people who were oftentimes taken disadvantage of. So Jesus, that's the background to the church. That's what's taking place in this city. And Jesus is going to send him a letter, and this congregation starts off, we're told, doing really good. We get a lot of positive things. But as we have done with our last lessons, we're going to break this up into four different parts. We're going to look at the authority that Christ establishes for himself, his acknowledgments, what the church has done, his admonition, how they need to fix themselves, and finally we're going to give his appeal to the church at Pergamos. So looking at his authority, in verse 12, Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, we read, And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has the sharp two-edged sword. Now this is a appeal back to Revelation 1.16 where Jesus says he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth with a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. Spoken of Jesus, he's referred to as someone who had a two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. Uh, You know, if you saw my Facebook status, the, the beauty of this message is evident to us. Jesus, who is the word of God, according to John 1 verse 14, Jesus, who is the the means by which we know God, he is referred to as the word. And here we see that out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, the word of God being often referred to as a sharp sword. Again, the picture is apparent. Christ delivers the word of God, and it is a capable weapon. Used figuratively of the Lord in four instances, each indicating judgment, we see this style, this wording used, the two-edged sword. In Revelation chapter 2, verse 12, we read again the sharp two-edged sword. In verse 16, we're told, Repent or else I will come to them quickly, and I'll fight against them with the sword of my mouth. In Revelation 19, verse 15, so first he he talks about judgment against the church. Those two verses, 12 and 16, are judgment against the church. But starting in in chapter 19, we see this illustration, the sword of the mouth used in judgment against the world. In Revelation 19, verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. 
And then in verse 21 of chapter 19, he says, And the rest were killed with the sword, which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. So we see that this sword is a sword of judgment. Oftentimes when we talk about the, the word of God, the sword, it is you know, the, used to help convey the gospel. It's used to help convict the hearts of men. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, you know, it's the idea of we proclaim the word of God so their hearts might be pierced. They might understand and see the truth of God's word. It's a sword that divides right down to the point of man. But we also see the same sword that will help us know God will also condemn us. And Jesus, showing his authority, showing his power, he lets us see in these four verses that he holds a sword that will judge the world. A sword that will condemn not only the world, but also those of the church who do not follow that word. As with the other examples, we see Christ establishing his authority, his right to judge in the book of Ephes in the, in the letter to Ephesus, he says, I have the power, my authority is to sustain. When he talks to the church at Smyrna, he says, I have the power over death. Here he says, I have the power to judge. His authority is ultimate. To sustain life over death and now to judge. Establishing his authority. He then goes on to give his acknowledgments. In verse 13, he says, I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is. And you hold fast to my name and do not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my, first, my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. He starts off saying, look, I know your works. And he says, they're good works. So many people say, oh, well, you know, God is just going to save us. We don't have to do anything. Once saved, always saved. It is astounding to me that people dismiss the necessity of us living and us working for the will of God. Now, no amount of good works can save us. But a life without good works will condemn us. And that is the distinction that we must make. It does not matter how many good things I do in my life. If I am not obedient to the will of God, I will not reach heaven. But at the same time, if I am baptized a thousand times, and yet I do not do a single good work, I also will not reach heaven. The Bible makes it abundantly clear. We must live a life that produces good works. In Matthew 16, verse 17, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, both good and bad. Works. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7. That the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Christ, the genuineness of your faith, the faith that has been put to work, that's been tested. Revelation 22, verse 12. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. 
And of course, James tells us in James 2, 17, that faith without works is dead. We must be living a life that produces good fruit. And that requires us to be working. Jesus commends this church because they were a church that worked. A church that worked despite where they lived. Understand, I told you this was the religious center of Asia. And it was a religious center that focused all on the Roman gods and on the the Roman emperors. Jesus refers to it as Satan's seat. It is a place where Satan was very much in control, very much working his will. Political persecution from the imperial capital, the seat of pagan deities, all of these things made this area a haven of corruption and a haven of Satan's will. But these people remained faithful, despite what Satan did, despite what Satan was trying to do. You know, in the parable of the tares in Matthew 13, starting in verse 24, we read another parable he put forth to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in the field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. Satan had gone. He had sowed tares in the wheat. His servants say, sir, didn't we plant good? Continues on. He says, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us to go and gather them up? But he said, no, lest you, while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them. They gather the wheat into my barn. We're told quite simply that Christ knows who belongs to him, but he also knows that Satan has worked and that his workers are going to remain among us. There's nothing to do sometimes to get them all out. But at judgment, they will be dealt with. In Luke chapter 8, verse 12, those by the wayside are the ones who hear if the devil comes and takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. Satan is working. And here in this area, while these people are doing their own works, these people are are doing what was necessary to be pleasing to God, Satan was also working. It was a center of his power. He was undermining the truth in every way possible. But Jesus says that they held fast his name and had not denied the faith. You know, when a name is mentioned, when we talk about a name, they held fast to the name of Christ. They're talking about his authority. In Colossians 3, verse 17, we're told, Whatever you do in word or deed, do all according to the name of the Lord. Do it all by his authority. And we see that baptism, we are baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Baptized by the authority of these. We pray in the name of Christ. We pray by the authority of Christ. He says, you held fast to my authority. Despite everything that's going on. And because they held fast to his name, they have not denied the faith. In Jude 3, Jude tells us, Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith. He says, I found out I need, to, I need to write to you to maintain, to hold fast to faith. There are so many people in the world that, you know, they get it, they accept it, they follow it. But then over time, they start to lose it. They start to struggle a little bit. Jude said, I needed to write to you to, to contend, to hold fast to that faith. But Jesus tells these people, you held fast to faith. You accepted my authority. And you held fast to your faith because of it. In Colossians 1, 21 through 23, again, we're told that there needs to be a holding fast to faith. 
And you, who were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. If indeed you continue in the faith, we will be blameless if we hold fast to faith, if we continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away by the hope of the gospel which you heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. What's so significant about this is that Jesus says, you held fast even with the death of Antipas. Now, this is the only time that Antipas is mentioned. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about him. But he was a faithful martyr. Historically, we're told that he was the first martyr of the Roman Empire. Now, whether that's accurate or not, we don't know, but it, it gives you the idea of the significance that he held during the early church that that was what was recorded. And Jesus here says, you stayed faithful even with that tragic event. Tragedy befalls and it shakes us sometimes, but these people, despite everything they were facing, despite sitting in the house basically sitting by the seat of power of Satan, dealing with the persecution of the death of a beloved, faithful martyr of Christ, they were told that they held on to the faith. This is good. This is what we want to read. Right up until Jesus says, but I have one thing against you. There are some of you who have gone after the teachings of Balaam. Now, Peter talks about Balaam. In 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 15, he says, They have forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. Balaam is recorded for us in Numbers chapter 22 through 25, and we understand, we, most of us remember the story. Uh, just to rehash it, Balaam was a prophet of God who was basically begged by the king Balak to come and curse the people of God. He said, I can't do that. God won't let me. I can't do it. And he was begged over and over and over, and he really wanted the money. So we're told that he goes finally, and God says, you do it, but there's going to be punishment. And because of his desire, because of his willingness to do what God did not want him to do, he ends up losing his life. He ends up being put to death. Because he loved the wages of unrighteous, unrighteousness. And Jesus says, some of you have followed after that pattern. You love the world. You love the riches of the world. You love what has caused others to stumble. He also says there are those who have held the doctrine of the Michaelitians. Now we don't know. This is only the second time they're mentioned and we don't know anything about this doctrine, but it must have been, re must have been rather widespread. Revelation 2.6 also mentions it. And it's tied in relation to the doctrine of Balaam. So it must have been, again, the idea of worldliness. Jesus says, you've allowed people who hold these doctrines to stay there. To grow in power, to fester and corrupt the church. So we have some admonition for him. In verse 16, he says, Repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the mouth of my sword. He says, you need to repent. You need to get rid of these people. You need to get rid of these who are holding to these false doctrines, who are holding to these wicked beliefs. He's telling the church, you need to repent. Because you have in your midst these people who cling to these false ideas. 
He says, else I will come to you with the sword because I'm going to fight against them. The solution is simple. Repent. Change. Remove them. God cannot stand the practice of sin. He says, I'm going to come to you quickly. And when we allow sin to stay in our midst, God judges us for it as well. We might not even be partakers of the sin. But when we allow those who are to stand with us and to be part of us, God judges us for it. He is condemning the church for their inability, their unwillingness to properly distance themselves and discipline these individuals who have taken this false doctrine. In Ephesians 5, verse 11, we're told, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. In Romans 16, verse 17 and 18, we're told, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you've learned, and avoid them. For such, for those who are such do not serve our Lord Christ Jesus, but their own belly." And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Paul warns them, warns the church at Rome. Hey, put these away, get rid of them, mark them, because they're going to corrupt the whole church. It would be Paul who said a little leaven leavens the whole lump. The church here was going to start festering. It was going to start dying. It wasn't going to continue to hold on to the faith because they're not dealing with these who have compromised, who have turned against God. Instead, they're allowing them to stay. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 6, we're told, But we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw from every brother who walks disorderly and not according to the tradition which you received from us. You know, when we talk about compromise, we talk about a church that has compromised. You think, oh, well, that's a church that has left its first love. That's what was told of Ephesus, right? But that's not what Jesus is talking about here. Here, the compromise wasn't that the church as a whole has started to turn away from God. It was that they weren't dealing with those who had. They were compromising and allowing them to stay. Just like the church of Corinth they had a man who was so sinful and yet they, they weren't willing to tell him, you're wrong, go away. Jesus condemns the church for this. And he says, if you don't fix it, I'm going to come myself and deal with it. So Jesus makes his appeal. Revelation chapter 2, verse 17, he says... He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, and on that stone a new name, written which no one knows except him who receives it. In verse 14, they talk about the things that have been offered to idols and the sacrifices and things that have been made there. The idea of Balaam and those who have been sacrificed. But here, Jesus tells them, I offer you the hidden manna. It's a contrast. It's the manna that's referenced in the law of Moses. In Exodus chapter 16, verse 33, Moses said to Aaron, take a pot and put an omer of manna in it and lay it up before the Lord to be kept for your generations. The bread that God provides. Pulling back to that illusion, Christ says, I will offer you the hidden bread. Stay away from things offered to idols, and I will provide for you the bread that comes from God. In 
Hebrews chapter 9, verse 4. More concerning this manna, we read, which had a golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides of gold, in which were the golden pot that had the manna, Aaron's rod that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Now, what is this manna? Well, to us, Jesus says he's the bread of life. John chapter 6, verse 35. There is a spiritual need for bread. He tells them, you avoid the physical bread, the physical meat offered to idols. And I will provide you the manna, the spiritual food that you so desperately need. Christ, which is life. He then tells them, if you will listen, again, his plea, listen, take heed to my words. He provides them bread. He also says, I'll provide you a white stone. White being a symbol of purity. Understand the book of Revelation is full of symbols. He offers them a stone that is pure, holy. In ancient courts, one who was convicted, notified, was notified with a black pebble dropped in an urn. And innocence was a white pebble. Their custom was if it's guilt, you have a black pebble. If you're innocent, you have a white pebble. Jesus taking this custom, knowing their customs, he says, I will give you a white stone. I will make you innocent. And then he says, I'm going to give you a new name. A new relationship. We are a new creature. How fitting is it that we will have a new name? He's telling them you have a new relationship with me. And no one except the Lord knows that name. Because only God knows our heart. This idea that Jesus presents is he's telling them, if you stay true, your innocence will be known, and you will be mine. The church at Pergamos had a lot of very good things going for them. They were facing persecution. They were facing a variety of of horrible situations. But they were holding true. They held to the name of Christ. They held to their faith. But Jesus warns them that you're compromising your willingness to allow those who practice sinful doctrines to stay among you is going to bring it all down. And for this cause, we refer to them as the church that compromised. A church that had everything going right, and yet they were on the verge of losing it all. Jesus says, if you will remain faithful, everything will turn right. This morning, we stand as a church that again, must look at ourselves. Are we the persecuted church? Are we the church that's lost its first love? Are we the church that is in fear of compromising? <clears throat> These letters were written so that we can look at ourselves and make the necessary judgment, the necessary changes that we might need to make. And as a congregation, we need to view these things. But as an individual, we must ask ourselves, are we among those that have fallen away? Are we among those that have been led astray by the doctrine of Balaam and the doctrine of, doctrine of the Nicolaitans? This morning, if you were here and you haven't been faithful to God, you've allowed the world to pull you away, then we encourage you to repent. Turn back to God. Turn back to him. 
so that you might have life. But if you are here and you've not done what is necessary to be a child of His, understand that these seven churches, while some are good and some are bad and some have problems, the reality is they're all still churches of Christ. Christ is helping them. He's guiding them. He's redirecting them back to him. But you do not belong to him. If we can study with you, if we can help you see what you need to do so that you might be a child of his, now's the time. Let us open up the word of God. Let us show you how Christ died for you. Let us see how his blood was shed so that you might have life. If you believe that he is the Christ, then will you not change? Will you not repent? Will you not make a confession before others that he is the Christ? And then will you not be baptized so that you might have life? Will you not become part of that body? body that Christ cared so much for that he personally sent letters to these churches. What love does Christ have for his church? If you're here this morning, you need to pray as a congregation. If we can help you in any way, now's the time. So we stand in as we say. I find affection <laughs> to the cross. This I heart right. Oh.